then it came together. It was just like, oh, just that puzzle piece in there just sort of fell into place. And the song became Love Shack. We are back with Kate Pearson of the B-52s, the great dance party fun band with the style that we we all still try to uh, mimic, but we just can't pull it off the way that you all could. And now we're going to get into Love Shack from the 1989 album Cosmic Thing. And in between what we were just talking about with Rock Lobster, your first album, your second album with Private Idaho, Mesopotamia, um, Whammy, then life happened. And tell us about just 1989, several years gone by since your last album, and what was happening with you, what was happening with the band, and kind of the backdrop of going into the studio and writing songs for Cosmic Thing. We did Bouncing Off the Satellites, <clears throat> which is the last song, last album that Ricky did before he passed away. And he completed, Ricky had completed the whole album. And the, the record company said, go back and write a hit. So we were in the midst of that when Ricky really became sick and then he passed away, but we had the album completed. That album was, I thought was just a really great album, but the record company was just not gonna really push it because they figured that's it, the band's breaking up. And, and a lot of, well, we didn't record. I mean, we didn't tour. Although we did try to promote the album just by doing interviews, yeah. but there was just no way we were going to tour without Ricky. And we were just in terrible mourning. It was such a blow, such a shock. And we were just numbed and we didn't know what, we didn't know really if we were going to continue. And after a little while, um, well, Keith Strickland, we were living in New York City at the time. Um, we had all originally had this house in Mayapack, New York, where we lived together. And um, that was, interesting but we eventually all that's a there are a lot of stories there <clears throat> yeah so we eventually we had fun you know but it was just too much band living together in the same house so we all eventually started living in new york city and keith strickland decided he wanted to get out after ricky passed away he said i can't be here anymore too many memories and so he um decided to come up a friend invited us to woodstock laura levine she's a rock photographer and a good friend of ours so so I went up, uh, Robert Waldrop and Keith and I came up to visit her and he wound up renting a house and then I wound up buying a house, a little cabin. And <clears throat> so I was up here and I would, a couple of years went by and I canoed over, I could canoe right over to where Keith lived because we were on this pond. And he started playing some music for me that he had been working on. And he said, you know, what do you think? And I thought, this is, this is amazing and then he played it for the rest of the band and you know it just seemed like after after this mourning period we w realized what we have each other is so important that actually it's Ricky's part of this still Ricky's part of this like us and if we get together and write more there has to be some sort of healing power in this so that's how yeah. we really started and we started jamming and and by the way, just for everybody who's listening out there, Ricky and Cindy were brother and sister. Yes. And did you feel after Ricky passed away, um, maybe you, you just didn't have any thinking about it because it was so overwhelming, mm. but did you have a feeling at that time also that the <clears throat> band was, that was kind of it for the band? I didn't know. It was just an unknown. Yeah. In fact, we never yeah. made any decision like, well, that's it. I guess, you know, we, we all kept in touch. Yeah. And so we still kept our sort of circle of light going and, uh, and also our other friends that were around us. And, and then, you know, the AIDS epidemic was happening then in full, full swing. So, so many friends of ours were dying. So it was a very dark time and it was very, um, just difficult to get through in any way. Aside from mourning Ricky, there were other other friends who were dying that were very close, and so it was an intense, just grieving time. And I and I think we needed to come out of that. And so when we started writing again, it was like, wow, the healing power of music. This is amazing. And we started uh, jamming, it and we realized it was going to work. And we did a lot of talking. In those jam sessions, we spent a lot of time just talking and 
hanging around and we found this little studio in lower Manhattan. It's, it's funny, I don't know why we found this little place and, and we had for the first time, like an engineer who could record things. Uh, and our jamming process with the tape recorder now was transformed into something in a studio with Pro, with Pro Tools. So this was a whole different ball game where we could collage things together, like say to the, you know, we jam and then we could say to the engineer, hey, what about that part with this part, this part, let's move it all around. Like that's right. the way we used to do it, sort of almost like cut and paste before. So it was an easier process, but when you said, oh, how much fun, you know, you had writing in the beginning, it was fun and, and amazing, but very hard work you know, or concentration anyway, just to try to piece these parts together and listen to the tape and you hear something in the background. But this made the process easier, having an engineer to work with us. And um, it was just like, whoa, when we started writing, we realized that we started writing songs that were conjuring our time in Athens and those sweet kind of memories we had of hanging out with Ricky and uh, just everyone together in our larger group of friends. Um, like Deadbeat Club is very autobiographical. And that's one of those songs that just sort of poured out of us, I think, when we jammed. Some songs, maybe the very first jam, you get all the gold. And sometimes it's much later after many hours of jamming. And some songs you, know, you might jam for hours and it's like, mm, that's never going to work. But, you know, yeah. we, but th these songs just kind of came together in a really pretty quick way. So Love Shack, did that <clears throat> did that come together quickly? Was that near the beginning of the process? Was it at the end of the process? Because one of the things I read was that Love Shack almost didn't make it onto the album. Right. It was near the end of the process and we had several versions. Now at this point, Keith was writing all the instrumentation. So he took over from Ricky and learned, you know, he already played guitar and multi-instrumentalist, but he, we, this was a whole different way of writing. He would commute from Woodstock four days a week and come down to the studio and he would have music. And so he'd have a track and it wasn't too formulated. It was a track with changes. So yeah. sometimes what he envisioned, oh, this might, this is the chorus. No, no, this is going to be the verse now. But the way we jammed on it and the way it would turn out sometimes is not the way he wrote it or envisioned it. But it was just parts that he would make and really beautiful instrumental parts that he had recorded. So when he played the record, we jammed to that. We jammed to a track. So this was a new way of doing things and it made it much easier. But Love Shack, we, I don't know, we went through several different versions of it. it, just wasn't happening. And now my memory, which is the true memory of it, I'm sure everyone else has a different memory, <laughs> but I know that the part, the love shack is a little old place where that chorus, I thought that's the chorus. It has to happen more than once. And Fred was like, well, that happens once. And so, you know, all these great parts are in there. We, we, that's the way it's true. That's the way we've written a lot where we've string the parts together and we have a lot of great parts and there's not maybe a big chorus or something, or the chorus is part of many, you know, one of many parts. But so we got to the, um, and Keith Strickland, I remember saying, I don't know if we could put it on the album. It's just, it's not finished. And he was right. It's not finished. So we got into the studio and Don was, was the producer of this, uh, and great producer. Great. And Nile Rogers, there's a lot of stories about this, but anyway, Nile Rogers and Don was split the producing on this record because neither had the time to do the whole thing. So <clears throat> we met with both of them and we decided to use both producers. And when the time came to record with Don was, we went to Dreamland Studio, which is up here near Woodstock. And it's a funky little studio. It's still going. It's beautiful. It's in an old church and it's got an old funky kitchen. And we would, uh, so we started out just rehearsing the songs with Don. And I said something to Don about, shouldn't, shouldn't that be the chorus? Shouldn't that happen more than once? I just sort of mentioned it. And then of course he mentioned it because if I mentioned it, I'd be like, oh no, no, no. So anyway, he mentioned, uh, you know, I think we should have that in, you know, 
in more than once. And so we Yeah, put he it, agreed with you. Once he put it in the right place and we started, you know, jamming, I mean, re- actually working the song and playing it live in the studio, then it came together. It was just like, oh, just that puzzle piece in there just sort of fell into place and the song became Love Shack. And okay. then the, and then of course uh, then of course I got to ask you about Tin Roof Rusted. Well, that became came about because as I said Keith had the recorded instrumental track so he was playing that and when it ended Cindy was still in her own head wailing all of us were just kind of wailing and she was just like Tin Roof and the tape stopped and she said Rusted. And that was such a magic moment we thought Okay, this has got to be part of the song. I mean, this is just, we have to do it just this way. And a lot of the uh, songs we did copy the jams, you know, in a way that were, that was like, okay, it has to be done just this way that it's in the jam. So we would learn the jam. And because it was such a happy accident, I guess, that things turn out some ways um, that you just, you just have to kind of capture it the way it was in the jam, even if it's kind of a crazy, sometimes Cindy and I, I will start with a harmony and the harmonies are all just spontaneous. They were never thought out or never like, Oh, do a third or we'll do a fourth, yeah. you know, interval. It was just, and it would be like this, you know, I would start at the top, she'd start there and then we'd, and then that's the way we'd wind up singing it live too, even though what didn't make any sense necessarily, but it made sense in the in the sense that it made everything very unique sounding. Yeah, I mean, look, again, there's yet another story. I have almost in every interview when I'm speaking with great artists, um, there's so much serendipity to these things that become yeah. classic moments. And so just based on what you said, it sounds like none of you had it written down, tin roof rusted on that. No. That is no. such a standout part of that song. Yeah. And then the tape ends and she's just wailing and you're all wailing but she's wailing yeah. and you capture it and you find a place for it in the song uh to yeah. make it part of the overall signature yes and so much of of our music comes out of that serendipitous moment and the collective unconscious and just kind of because when you're jamming yeah. you're not necessarily hearing each other and there's no one comes in with i mean lyric ideas sometimes but not any kind of no one comes in with a big set of writing lyrics and if they did on occasion they'd all it would be just completely different by the end of it you know some of it would be all placed in different spots and completely uh and, rearranged and when you finished recording the album did love shack stand out to you oh yeah i thought wow this is this is it. And we did, we played it for REM, stopped into the studio and they heard Love Shack and they were like, yeah, that's, that's, that's it. That's special. Yeah. That's special. It was such a groove too. The, the music that Keith did had such a, a different groove than a lot of other B-52 songs. It was more funky, you know, it was really yeah. danceable and kind of a, not a herky jerky way. It was just a real groove and it was just different. So I just knew it really stood out and yet it still had our signature sound. Yeah. And by the way, you mentioned REM, obviously an amazing band, and you had your own collaborations with Michael Stipe in the yes. band. Um, Shiny Happy People is such a great song. And I, uh, I just want to mention also, for those of you out there who don't know, Kate's collaboration with Iggy Pop for the song Candy, that's an incredible song too. Thank but you, yeah. It was amazing. And then when the album came out, yeah. how did Love Shack and the album change your lives, if at all? Well, it did certainly change our lives. I mean, we um, had never experienced having a big hit, even though I, I guess a lot of our songs were very popular and we had a really great touring uh, audience and we always had a great reaction. We never had an audience that booed us or was lethargic. Everyone always danced. I mean, even way before Love Shack, before that album, everyone always, even like I said before, we didn't know if Rock Lobster or some of our songs, early songs were weird. And the first party we played that Valentine's party, our friends danced like crazy. So we knew we had something. 
you know, when people got up and danced and we played CBGBs or Max's Kansas City and even the punks, even the hardcore punks and leather jackets started dancing. We knew that this was sort of the spark ignited. So, yeah, yeah I think um, it, it just, I, I knew Love Shack was really one of those things that got people going. <laughs>